Book Two, Chapter Three of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book Two, Chapter Three. Say, prisoner at the bar, are you or are you not guilty of the murder of Lord Westray? Not guilty. The answer comes in a clear and distinct voice, a voice in which there is neither faltering nor evasion. It is a voice singularly rich and melodious, a voice which one would think could not readily lie. A hum runs through the crowded court, an indescribable buzz and movement of excitement, but there is joy and relief on many a face where hitherto doubt and perplexity had reigned. The court is crowded to suffocation. All the well-known faces of the day are present. The rush to obtain admittance has been unprecedented, and the excitement and popular feeling in regard to the case is unparalleled in the annals of the law courts. He stands there very quietly, but erect as a dart. His arms are folded on his chest, and his whole carriage is one of easy dignity. None, looking at the beautiful face, with its clear, radiant complexion, magnificent eyes, and high, pale, thoughtful brow, around which the old gold curls lovingly cluster, could bring themselves to believe that that man is a murderer. Yet, as we have seen, of crime so terrible Hector de Strain stands accused. Since that fearful night when, with murder in his eyes, he had burst into that room of ill fame and found his beloved mother in the power and at the mercy of the man who had blighted her early life, and who had pursued her with such relentless vengeance, neither Hector de Strange nor society at large had seen Lord Westray. As we may remember, the former in that moment of horror and fury had been tried to the highest pitch. A shot had rung out through the silent house, followed by a loud cry, and that was all. He stands accused not merely of murder, but of having secreted the body of his victim with intent to avoid detection. At the coroner's inquest evidence had been forthcoming to show how, acting upon various anonymous communications received, the heir at law of the deceased had placed the matter in the hands of the police, who thereupon had discovered the body in clothes of Lord Westray buried deep in the ground at Mrs. Delara's residence near Windsor. Evidence had likewise been forthcoming to prove that Hector de Strange was the last person seen in the company of Lord Westray, and the clothes of the murdered nobleman had been fully identified by his valet and others as those in which he was last seen alive. The body was, of course, past recognition. Two years in the earth would necessarily render it so. Yet on the skeleton little finger of one hand a plain gold ring had been found as also around the skeleton's neck a gold chain and locket, the latter containing a faded portrait of the late Countess of Westray, the Earl's mother. It had been proved that Lord Westray always wore this ring, chain, and locket, and his valet had sworn that he was wearing them the very day on which he disappeared. Public opinion was perplexed. Even those who would glory in Hector de Strange's innocence found it difficult to believe him so. Everything appeared so clear against him, so unanswerably conclusive, that men and women shook their heads and sighed when hopes of his acquittal were expressed. But the day of the trial had come at last, and Hector de Strange was there to confront his accusers. In face of the terrible charge preferred against their chief, the members of the ministry have unconditionally resigned, and a provisional government, pending an appeal to the country, has been hastily constructed from the National Party. The government of the day is therefore known to be rapidly antagonistic to the late revolutionary Prime Minister, who now stands accused of murder. The counsel retained for the prosecution by the Crown is the Attorney General, aided and assisted by two QCs, but Hector de Strange has retained no one to aid him. He defends himself. And now, with a flourish and many theatrical attitudes, Sir Anthony Stickleback begins the case for the prosecution. Sir Anthony is fond of rhetoric, and he airs it to the court, fully to his own satisfaction. He has many long-winded phrases to get through before he closes with the main point, 
which may be briefly told in his closing summary of the statements contained in his opening address. I shall therefore, my lord, call witnesses who will speak to the evident intimacy which has existed between Mr. de Strange and Mrs. de Lara through so many years. These witnesses will be able to show, moreover, that on several occasions Mrs. de Lara received visits from her late husband, Lord Westray, during Mr. de Strange's absence. That she was frequently in the habit of mysteriously disappearing from her residence near Windsor on visits to London, and that on one of these occasions, the occasion in fact when Mr. de Strange followed her, she actually left a note for her maid, acquainting her with her departure. I shall show how Mr. de Strange, having surprised her in the company of Lord Westray, deliberately fired his revolver at that nobleman. The last thing seen of this latter unfortunate gentleman was in the company of Mr. de Strange, who had announced his intention of taking him to his home in Grosvenor Square. It is needless to say that, from that day forward, Lord Westray has never been seen in living life, though in consequence of several anonymous communications received, private inquiry was set on foot by those who had been determined to bring the murderer to justice, and which has resulted in the discovery of the body and the clothes which Lord Westray was wearing when last seen, buried deep in the earth, in the private grounds near Windsor belonging to Mrs. Delara. I will now, my lord, proceed to call the witnesses for the prosecution." And one by one the witnesses are brought forward to swear away the life of Hector de Strange. Charles Weston deposes that he was for many years Mrs. de Lara's butler, and that he frequently admitted Lord Westray to her house, but always in the absence of Mr. de Strange. Only on one occasion did Mr. de Strange come in while Lord Westray was in the house and he recalls high words passing between the two, followed by the hasty departure of Lord Westray, whose brougham was awaiting him at Mrs. de Lara's door. This was when she resided in London. After this Lord Westray always came on foot, and he, Weston, had strict orders to keep a sharp lookout for Mr. de Strange, so as to give the two full warning. He remembers perfectly well bringing Mrs. de Lara a note from Lord Westray the very day on which she disappeared from her Windsor residence, and the same on which Lord Westray was murdered, and he also remembers a note being left that night by Mrs. de Lara for her maid. Cross-examined by Hector de Strange. Are you not a discharged servant of Mrs. de Lara's, Weston? No, sir, answers this person with cool effrontery. I gave notice myself. You will swear, Weston, that Mrs. de Lara did not dismiss you for drunkenness and gross impertinence? Certainly, sir. Mrs. de Lara told me I had had too much to drink, and I told her I would leave. I gave a month's notice. Thank you, Weston. I have no more to ask you. Hector de Strange's voice has a peculiar ring of unutterable contempt in it. The wretch winces as he received the order to stand down. Victoire Hester is next called. She deposes to being Mrs. de Lara's late maid. She corroborates Charles Weston's evidence. Asked if she remembers the writing paper used by Mrs. de Lara and Hector de Strange. Perfectly, is her reply. Can she select a specimen from amidst the packet of letters handed her? Certainly, she replies again. In a few minutes she has picked out three letters all written in the same hand and on a similar stamp of paper. This, she declares, is the paper used by Mrs. de Lara and Mr. de Strange all the time that I have been in Mrs. de Lara's service. Asked again if she recognizes the handwriting on the letter, she unhesitatingly declares it to resemble Lord Westray's. Asked if she received a note from Mrs. de Lara acquainting her with her sudden departure for London the night of the murder, she answers, Yes. Cross-examined by Hector de Strange. Victoire Hester, are you not engaged to Charles Weston? And were you not dismissed by Mrs. de Lara? No, sir, she unblushingly replies. I gave notice same as Charles did, because Mrs. de Lara behaved so improperly to me. Victoire Hester, you say that Mrs. de Lara left a note for you on the night of the supposed murder of Lord Restray, informing you she had gone to London? Yes. 
is the reply. But was she not in the habit of frequently going up to town in the same way without leaving notes? Yes, sir. Then how is it she should trouble to do what she had never done before, Victoire Hester? The maid is visibly flurried. I don't know, sir, she stammers. Thank you, Victoire. The cold, calm, contemptuous voice comes again, and the maid in turn steps down. Alfred Hawkins corroborates Charles Weston's evidence as to driving Lord Westray to Mrs. Delara's South Kensington residence on one occasion. He states that he was groomed to the late lord, and is still so to his successor. "'I call for Mr. Trackham,' enunciates Sir Anthony Stickleback in an important voice. "'Since the accused does not wish to ask Alfred Hawkins any questions.' Mr. Trackham enters the witness-box. He is extremely well dressed, and has an air of importance about him. Like Sir Anthony, he has evidently a good opinion of himself. Mr. Trackham, you own a certain house in Verdigris Crescent, do you not? inquires Sir Anthony blandly. I do, sir, answers Mr. Trackham. Have you, or have you not, admitted Mrs. Delara to the house? Frequently, sir, answers that individual. Presumably, for what purpose? On each occasion, sir, to meet Lord Westray. Do you, Mr. Trackham, know anything of Rita Vernon? asked Sir Anthony. Certainly, sir. She used frequently to visit my house. Will you name the last two occasions you have seen her, Mr. Trackham? Well, sir, the first was on the night of the 20th of June, 1894, and the last on the night of Westray's murder answers Mr. Trackham. Was she with anyone on those two occasions? Yes, sir, each time with the same person. And that person, Mr. Trackham, was? The Duke of Ravensdale, answers the scoundrel quickly. A movement of intense surprise pervades the court. Will you describe to his lordship and the jury all you know about the terrible occurrence of which Lord Westray was the victim, Mr. Trackham? commands Sir Anthony Stickleback, folding his arms. "'I will do my best, sir. On the afternoon of the day in which Lord Westray disappeared, I received a note from Mrs. Delara, sent especially by Rita Vernon. In this note she instructed me to retain my house free for the night, and to omit no one but Lord Westray. I acted as requested, and she and his lordship arrived about half-past one. I retired to bed and there being no one in the house but two men-servants and a woman. The men, like myself, had retired to rest. Suddenly I was startled by a hearing a shot, followed by a loud cry. I jumped out of bed, slipped into my trousers, and called my two men. We proceeded to the room in which were Lord Westray and Mrs. Delara. On entering we found it in possession of Mr. Destrange, the Duke of Ravensdale, and Rita Vernon. The two latter were beside Mrs. Delara, who was lying on a sofa. Lord Westray was stretched out on the floor, blood issuing from a wound in the throat, and above him stood Mr. Destrange, with a discharged revolver in his hand. I at once rushed up to him and accused him of attempting to murder Lord Westray. He replied that he was sorry for what he had done, but that he did it in a moment of passion. He declared that he did not think he had seriously hurt the Earl, and that he would take him to his home if I could procure a cab. At the same time he begged the Duke of Ravensdale and Rita Vernon to take charge of Mrs. Delara. I was getting seriously alarmed at the turn affairs had taken, and upon Lord Westray expressing a wish to get home I acceded to Mr. Destrange's request. Two cabs were procured. In one of them Mr. Destrange and Lord Westray took their departure. In the other, Mrs. Delara, the Duke, and Rita Vernon. I saw them off from the door, and then re-entered the house. As I did so, I heard a groaning in a room on the right. I procured a light and opened the door, the key of which was turned in the lock. To my surprise, I found my woman-servant laid out on the ground, bound hand and foot with handkerchiefs, while a third gagged her mouth. I produced these handkerchiefs now. One has a ducal coronet on it, the other H. to Strange worked on it, and the third the name of Rita Vernon. Next day I received a letter, 
apparently in Lord Westray's writing, begging me to keep strict silence on all that had occurred. He declared that if it leaked out his reputation would be lost, and he informed me that he intended disappearing for a couple of years, at the end of which he would return. He enclosed me some money and promised to continue the donation quarterly on a condition of my silence. I received six donations in all and three letters. At last the donation ceased and I began to grow suspicious. What first made you suspicious? Well, sir, I noticed one day that the paper on which these letters were written was exactly similar to the quality used by Mrs. Delara in her note to me on the afternoon of the day when the murder was committed, and I also thought Lord Westray's continued absence after the time specified was suspicious. Finally, I went and made a clean breast of it to the present Earl, who I found in receipt of various anonymous communications declaring the murder and indicating where the body and clothes were concealed. He employed me to find out all I could. I set to work, sir, communicated with the police, and investigations were set on foot, with the result as we all know it. Ah, you combine the work of a private detective with your other business, do you, Mr. Trackham? inquires the Attorney General graciously. I do, sir. Cross-examined by Hector de Strange. Have you the letter which you allege Mrs. Delara wrote you? The counsel for the prosecution has it, sir, answers Mr. Trackham. Is it not a little strange you should have preserved that letter all these years, in view of the fact that you thought Lord Westray alive? And is it not a little strange that your communication to the new Lord Westray should have been almost simultaneous with the receipt of by him of anonymous information?" pursues the accused. It is Mr. Trackham's turn to look confused, but he quickly pulls himself together as he answers, "'No, I do not think so.' Other witnesses are called to corroborate Mr. Trackham's statement in some particulars, and to testify to the discovery of Lord Westray's body and clothes, the latter being produced in court this production causing much excitement. Walter Long is next called. He identifies the chain, locket and ring found on the skeleton as belonging to his late master, and he also identifies the clothes. He swears positively that Lord Westray was wearing all these things the day he disappeared. "'These, my lord,' declares Sir Anthony, "'are the witnesses for the prosecution.' And with this statement the court adjourns for luncheon. On reassembling, Hector de Strange opens the case for the defense. "'I shall not,' he observes quietly, "'detain the court at any length with my opening statement. I have been charged with undue intimacy with Mrs. Delara. The charge is stupid and disgusting. And when I inform your lordship and the gentlemen of the jury that Mrs. Delara is my mother, this will at once be evident, and show the groundlessness of the charge.' I deny the statement that Lord Westray was a frequent and admitted visitor at my mother's house, though he made many endeavours to be one. Only once he obtained ingress, and was ordered out both by Mrs. Delara and myself. He has been the curse of my mother's life. The sufferings of Lady Altay must be green in the memory of many, while the fate that befell my father at his hands is a matter of history. I shall call Mrs. Delara who will deny having written either to Mr. Trackham or to her maid. She will explain how these so-called mysterious visits to London were solely to see her child. She will describe to you how it was her custom to walk out at night in her grounds at Windsor, and how on the evening of the day on which I am accused of murdering Lord Westray she was set upon by two men, gagged, bound hand and foot, transferred to a carriage, and taken in it to London where, at the house of Mr. Trackham, she was handed over to the mercy of Lord Westray, from whom God in his mercy enabled me to rescue her in time. This evidence will be corroborated by Rita Vernon, who will explain all she was eyewitness to. She will tell you how she clung to the back of the brougham which contained Mrs. Delara all the way to London, and having taken note of the house, which, alas, she knew too well, hurried to Montagree House to apprise the Duke of Ravensdale, whom she knew to be my dear friend, of the terrible occurrence. There she happily found both him and myself, and we at once proceeded to my mother's rescue. Effecting an entrance into the house, we
we gagged and bound the woman who led us in, and then, guided by Rita Vernon, stole noiselessly upstairs to what Rita styled the best room. On reaching the door she halted, and bade me listen to a voice, which I recognized as that of Lord Westray's. Mad with fury, I dashed open the door. What to find? Why, my mother, gagged and bound, a prisoner in the hands of the scoundrel who had wrecked and ruined her life. My lord, would not the sight have driven you mad? I drew my revolver and shot him where he stood. He uttered a cry and fell. Quickly the duke and I cut the thongs that bound my mother. Her hands were cramped and saturated with blood, across both palms extending a ghastly gash. We carried her tenderly downstairs, procured a cab, and in Rita Vernon's and the Duke of Ravensdale's kind care she was transferred to Montagree House. I then went back to the room where Lord Westray was lying, where I found him alone with Mr. Trackham. I offered to call the police and state what had occurred. Lord Westray was seated on the sofa and begged me not to do so. He declared the wound was nothing, and requested me to leave him, and on no account to disclose what had occurred. For my mother's sake, and yet on another account, I agreed. Next day I called upon Mr. Trackham, who informed me of the letter he had received from Lord Westray, the contents of which he has communicated in his evidence to-day. I regret, however, to have to say that the greater part of the remainder of his evidence has been falsely given. Why, I am at a loss to understand, as beyond the encounter in the house at Verdigris Crescent I had no quarrel with him whatsoever. I propose now to call my witnesses." Mrs. Delara is called. Her appearance in court excites the greatest interest. For though few have seen the beautiful Lady Alte of former days, the story of her marriage, her flight with Harry Kintor, and the tragic sequel in which Lord Westray figured so prominently is well known in society. So this is Speranza Delara, mother of Hector de Strange. No wonder he is handsome, with such a mother as that," gasped Mrs. de Lacy Trevor. "'Dodo, dear, it's the same lovely woman we met him riding with on the Burton course long ago, at Melton, don't you remember? The mystery's cleared at last!' She stops abruptly and stares at her friend, for Lady Manderton is scarcely heeding her, and there are large tears in her fine, handsome eyes. "'Why, what is the matter, Dodo?' "'Nothing, Vivi, nothing. There, don't attract attention,' she answers hastily. She is thinking, though, how wasted has been her life. She has heard Hector de Strange's statement, and believes it implicitly. She is thinking that others may not, though. If Hector de Strange is condemned, well, Dodo Manderton feels that she would die to save him. End of Book Two, Chapter Three Book Two, Chapter Four of Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of Nineteen Hundred, Book Two, Chapter Four. Mrs. Delara queries Hector de Strange in a voice in which respect and tenderness are mingled. You have heard the statement for the prosecution in which you and I are accused of undue intimacy? You have heard my reply, in which I declare you to be my mother. Which statement is correct? Yours, she replies in a firm, clear voice. I am your mother. And my father, he again asks, was Captain Harry Kintor. Both Weston and Victoire state that they gave you a month's notice. Is this a fact? It is not she replies firmly. It was I who gave it to them, to Weston for being drunk and impertinent, to Victoire for the latter fault. It is stated by Weston that you were in the habit of receiving frequent visits from Lord Westray. Is this so? It is not, she answers quickly. The statement is a wicked falsehood. Only once he obtained admittance, when he came to insult me with the proposal that I should remarry him and forget the past. You came in when he was there and requested him to leave the house." "'Did he do so?' "'At once,' she replies. 
Since then, have you been annoyed by his presence, or in any other way?" "'By his presence, no, until the night in which he is alleged to have been murdered, but by letters, yes.' "'You have kept or destroyed those letters?' "'Every one is destroyed,' she replies almost fiercely. "'Most of them unopened.' Can you remember the date when Rita Vernon first came to you, who sent her?" "'Yes, well,' answers Speranza. "'It was the twenty-first of June, 1894. She brought a letter from you, written at the instance of the Duke of Ravensdale. I at once made her my secretary and general amanuensis. "'Has she served you faithfully?' "'None more so,' she replies. "'Mrs. Delara. Have you heard Mr. Trackham's statement that you sent her with a note to him on the day of the supposed murder? Is this true or false?" False, she replies sternly. And you have heard Victoire's declaration that you left a letter for her apprising her of your departure for London the night of the supposed murder. Is this true? It is not, she answers. I wrote no letter. Will you give his lordship and the gentlemen of the jury your version of what occurred on the night in question?" She gives it in a firm, clear voice, without hesitation or faltering. She tells the facts as we have described them in a former chapter. A shudder runs through the court at their mere recital. Is it possible that such horrors reflect the truth? Sir Anthony smiles superciliously. Hallucination, he mutters audibly. Many women are subject to it." She looks at him contemptuously, but scorns to further notice the great man's brutality. "'You swear, Mrs. Delara, that what you have stated is absolutely correct?' "'Absolutely,' she answers calmly. "'I swear it.' Cross-examined by the Attorney General. "'You will swear that you were not in the habit of receiving Lord Restray, Mrs. Delara?' Now pray be careful, very careful." Again the same contemptuous glance, as she proudly replies, "'I swear it.' "'And you mean to say that you never sent Rita Vernon with a letter to Mr. Trackham, or left a note for Victoire Hester on the day of Lord Westray's murder? Again I ask you to be careful.' "'I did not,' is her fierce reply. Sir Anthony puts his hands on his hips. There is a self-satisfied smile on his face as he glances round the court, but he questions no further. "'I have no more to ask the witness,' he remarks jauntily. Rita Vernon is next called and questioned. She describes her first meeting with the Duke of Ravensdale and what followed. She gives in simple, unaffected language the story of the attack on Speranza and the part she played in it. Again Sir Anthony is heard to mutter the word, "'Hallucination!' He has no questions to put to the witness. Yet stay. As she is about to leave the box, he jumps up. "'One moment, please, Miss Vernon,' he remarks in a suave voice. "'I presume, of course, that you are grateful to the Duke of Ravensdale for all his kindness?' There is a flash in her grey eyes, but she answers quietly, "'Need I ask it, sir? I would die for his grace.' The next witness is the Duke himself. He corroborates the statements made by Hector de Strange, Speranza de Lara, and Rita Vernon. His evidence is listened to with marked attention, and the keenest interest by the court. Sir Anthony does not cross-examine him. As he steps down, Hector de Strange's voice is heard speaking. "'I have one more witness to call,' he is saying. "'This will be my last, my lord. I call for Dr. Marionette.' A white-haired man enters the box and is sworn. Dr. Marionette, do you recall attending Mrs. Delara many years ago? inquires the accused. I do, replies the witness. Will you state for what purpose and how many years have elapsed since then? is the next question. I attended Mrs. Delara in her confinement, and it is twenty-eight years ago, answers the old doctor. Where, Dr. Marionette? At Ancona, sir, on the Adriatic. The child was born well and healthy, I believe. A beautiful child indeed, replies the doctor. I wish all children resembled it. Thank you, Dr. Marionette. 
"'Stay, I have a word, please, to put to you,' exclaims the Attorney General, jumping up. "'You have not told us the sex of the child, doctor.' For a moment the old man hesitates. Then he looks sadly at the prisoner. "'A girl it was,' he replies in a low voice. "'Ha! A girl, you say?' echoes the counsel for the prosecution in a loud voice as he looks round the court with a knowing air. "'Thank you, doctor. I am greatly obliged to you for that information.' This concludes the evidence for the defense. Then Sir Anthony rises slowly and portentously. His hands are behind him, he leans perilously forward, and his gown is stuck out behind like a lady's dress improver. He appears thoroughly satisfied with the appearance of importance which he believes this attitude gives him, but it is not so certain that others share that opinion. "'My lord and gentlemen of the jury,' he begins in a somewhat pompous voice, "'the case before us is a very peculiar one, yet I hope to detain you at very little length in reviewing it. The prisoner, Mr. Destrange, is accused of a base and horrible murder and it is my painful duty to endeavour to bring home to the jury the absolute certainty of his guilt. It will be necessary in so doing to show motive for the crime, and I think I shall be able to point to this motive as conclusive, jealousy prompting and being at the bottom of it. It is now, my lord and gentlemen of the jury, nigh on thirty years ago that Mrs. de Lara, then known as Lady Alte, broke faith with her husband whom in wedding she had sworn to love, honour, and obey, and shamelessly fled with her lover, Captain Harry Kintor. It is known that Lord Alte, who was devoted to his wife, pursued the two, coming up with them at Ancona. Here, having confronted them, a fierce dispute ensued. It is said that Captain Kintor drew a revolver, and in self-defence Lord Alte fired at him unfortunately with fatal effect. I wish to dwell as lightly as possible upon a matter so terrible, and therefore pass on to the next event in this painful story, namely the birth of a child. Dr. Marineth has been called, ostensibly, to bear witness to that birth. Unfortunately, he has marred the case for the defence by informing us that the child to which Mrs. de Lara gave birth was a female. Now, my lord, one of the chief points of Mr. Destrange's defence is that the intimacy which we declare has existed between him and this lady for so long a time is impossible, inasmuch as Mrs. de Lara is his mother. She has herself so stated this, and furthermore pointed to Captain Kintor as being Mr. Destrange's father. This statement must fall to the ground, in face of what Dr. Marineth has told us. So much for that portion of the defence as I do not suppose Mr. De Strange is going to pose before us as a woman. It would appear that Mrs. De Lara is not averse to this mode of life. She married Lord Alte by her own free will. Next, we find her leaving him and electing a new lover in the person of Captain Kintor. And of late years we have direct evidence that Mr. De Strange has been the favoured man. Yet not only this, but the evidence sworn to by Charles Weston, Victoire Hester and Mr. Trackham points to the existence of a secret intimacy carried on by this lady with her divorced husband, Lord Westray. Both she and Mr. Destrange now tell us that only once did the late Earl obtain admission to Mrs. de Lara's house, and then it was in opposition to the latter's wishes. I leave you to judge if this statement be possible of either acceptance or belief in face of what the witnesses referred to have told us. We have heard some evidence likewise of the way in which Rita Vernon became introduced into Mrs. de Lara's household. It appears that she was formerly no novice to Mr. Trackham's house. She does not deny this. In fact, how could she? Does it not strike you, gentlemen, that Rita Vernon was just a peculiar class of young woman to put in the responsible position described by Mrs. de Lara? and does it not seem very clear that the use to which her services were put was of a totally different nature? We were told distinctly by Mr. Trackham that Mrs. de Lara sent him a note by Rita Vernon on the day of the murder, instructing him to retain his house for her and Lord Westray. 
Mrs. Delara denies having written this note. I produce it, and it runs as follows. Sir, please to reserve the house tonight, as usual for Lord Westray and myself. We shall arrive between twelve and one. S. Delara. What is to be thought, my lord, of the veracity of such witnesses as Mrs. Delara and Rita Vernon, for the girl denies having delivered this note? Yet here we have it, and we have furthermore the fact that on the night when Mr. Destrain shot Lord Westray, Mrs. Delara was found alone with that nobleman in Mr. Trackham's house. And, gentlemen, us against this very clear and circumstantial evidence, we are asked by Mrs. Delara and Rita Vernon to accept a romance which all sane men can only regard in the light of hallucination, if not, as I regret to believe, downright deliberate falsehood. We are asked to believe that Mrs. Delara was waylaid in her own grounds at night, overcome by ruffians, and carried off bound hand and foot to London. We are asked to believe that a slight, frail girl like Rita Vernon performed a task which a man of Herculean strength would have found almost beyond his power to accomplish. We are asked, in fact, to believe that Rita Vernon, whom you have had an opportunity of seeing, could cling to a brougham between Windsor and London, and then sum up sufficient force to make her way to Montegree House at half-past two in the morning, where, of course, like in a fairy tale, she finds the Duke of Ravensdale and Mr. Destrange all ready to accompany her to the release of the Lady Fair. The story defeats its own end by its wild improbability, unsupported by fact, and establishes at once the reasonable and circumstantial evidence of the side for the prosecution. I maintain that there is proof positive that Mr. Destrange, assisted by Rita Vernon, who in this instance betrayed her mistress, came upon the unfortunate Earl with intent to murder. He admits that he shot him, but he declines to give any further information as to what he did with Lord Westray after leaving the house in Verdigris Crescent. We find, moreover, that the three letters purporting to come from Lord Westray and addressed to Mr. Trackham are all written on paper which Victoire Hester has identified as the quality and class always used by Mr. Destrange and Mrs. Delara, and exactly similar to the paper on which the notes to Mr. Trackham and Victoire Hester were penned on the day of the murder. The writing of the last note is denied. Again, I meet that denial by producing the note. It runs thus. Hester, I have gone up to town for a few days, will let you know when to expect me back. Miss Vernon has accompanied me. Faithfully yours, Estelara. Such facts leave very little doubt in my mind but that Mrs. Delara had arranged to meet Lord Westray, and that Rita Vernon betrayed her intention to Mr. Destrange. Such facts convince me that this latter resolved on vengeance. He deliberately went to Verdigris Crescent and shot Lord Westray, and finally, under cover of repentance, decoyed him from the house and got rid of him somehow and somewhere. What follows? A letter arrives for Mr. Trekham who is frightened out of his wits at the turn affairs have taken, a letter purporting to come from Lord Westray. By a strange coincidence, this letter and others following are all written on the same class of paper as that used by Mr. Destrange in Mrs. Delara's house. Lastly, the very suit which Lord Westray was known to have been wearing the night he was shot at has been found buried deep in the ground on the property of Mrs. Delara at Windsor bearing evidence of having been a long time under the earth, and, in close proximity to it, the body of a man reduced to a skeleton was also discovered. Around the neck of this skeleton a gold chain and locket was found, and on the little finger a plain gold ring. These have been identified by the late Earl's valet, who has sworn to seeing them on the Earl's person the day he disappeared. It would be superfluous for me to detain you with further details, the points of evidence which I have submitted being, it appears to me, too clear for it to be possible to draw any other conclusion but the one that Mr. Destrange deliberately, and of malice aforethought, did shoot at Lord Westray with intent to kill, and did afterwards, in some manner not yet unravelled, make away with the life of that unfortunate nobleman. I ask you, therefore, to put aside from your minds Mr. Destrange's high position and social status, 
and to find a verdict in accordance with the evidence before you." The great man sits down hastily and glances round the court. An almost unnatural stillness reigns therein. Every eye is bent on the prisoner, and then on the beautiful, pale, gold-headed woman whose gaze is riveted on her child's face with an intensity terrible to witness. There is nothing but calmness on the features of Hector de Strange, in whose eyes the confident, triumphant expression shines, which conscious innocence alone could create. "'I will endeavour, like the Attorney-General,' he observes, "'to detain the Court as shortly as possible. But at the very outset I would wish to point out to you that the evidence of Weston and Victoire is not trustworthy, as being that of discharged servants. Mrs. Delara has told you most emphatically that Lord Westray paid her no visits, save the one referred to by the coachman Alfred Hawkins. She has told you how that visit was forced upon her, and how Lord Westray was ordered out of the house by myself. There is absolutely no evidence corroborative of that given by Charles Weston, which I can only characterize as pure and malicious invention, the same remark applying to the false testimony of Victoire Hester. This woman has declared that Mrs. Delara wrote her a note the night of the supposed murder apprising her of her visit to London. Yet these visits with Mrs. Delara were of frequent occurrence, and she had never before found it necessary to acquaint Victoire of her movements. My lord, I declare the letter to be a forgery, as I also declare the letter to which Mr. Trackham refers as coming from Mrs. Delara to be likewise. My lord and gentlemen of the jury, the Attorney-General has passed a cruel and unnecessary sneer on Mrs. Delara's account of the ruffianly and brutal attack made upon her by the undoubtedly hired scoundrels of her most bitter foe. He has attributed all to romance, hallucination, deliberate falsehood. His insinuations are brutal and cowardly. My mother, like myself, would scorn to tell a lie. We leave that to the poltroons and cowards who seek by forgery and perjury to swear away the life of one who is innocent. I maintain that Mrs. Delara's account and description of what took place is in every essential particular true, while the corroborative evidence of Rita Vernon bears it out in every detail. The Duke of Ravensdale has clearly stated to you how the poor girl sought him at Montagre House, and the state she was in after her terrible drive. The Attorney-General smiles scornfully at the idea of a woman being capable of such pluck and heroism as Rita Vernon evinced on that occasion. I cast back to the slur into his teeth. I tell him that if he wishes to find true courage and heroism combined, he must go to a woman to discover it. But it is not to such as he that women will go for justice. And now, my lord and gentlemen of the jury, I ask you to put yourselves in my place. Had you been called to that house of ill fame, and there found a being whom you honoured, loved, and respected, in the hands and power of her bitterest enemy, bound hand and foot, gagged, bleeding, and helpless, would you not have acted as I did, and in the fury and horror of that moment lost all power of restraint? I admit that I shot Lord Westray. I have never denied it. But I do deny that I caused his death. And what is more, I confidently believe that he is alive at this moment, and that this foul accusation is a plot to ruin me, to be, in fact, revenged on yonder noble lady, who has through life resented his brutality, defied and scouted him, and refused to submit to his hideous desires. I make no pretense of being able to account for his disappearance, for the alleged discovery of his body in clothes for the letters written in his handwriting on the paper used by myself and Mrs. Delara. I am unable to understand it all save in the light of a base, foul, and detestable plot which has for its object revenge. Of that I know him to be perfectly capable. And now, my lord and gentlemen of the jury, I have but one more statement to make ere I close these remarks. I once more positively affirm that Mrs. Delara is my mother and that the intimacy of which I am accused is a base and unfounded fabrication." He has folded his arms and his voice has ceased. A burst of applause greets him as he stops speaking. Vainly the judge calls for order. 
This is an exhibition that I will not tolerate," exclaims that worthy functionary. Another such a disgraceful proceeding, and I will cause the whole court to be instantly cleared." This produces silence. Sir James Grumpy is a bit of a martinet. The public knows that he means what he says. And now he proceeds in his summing up. Very carefully he goes over all the points advanced by both sides, but it is apparent to all from the first that the summing up is most unfavorable to the accused. It takes him about an hour to get through his task, and all the time Hector de Strange stands motionless, with folded arms and immovable features. Only now and again the dark blue eyes wander to where Speranza is sitting, with the Duke of Ravensdale by her side. The summing up is over at length, and the jury have retired to consider their verdict. Apparently, however, they had made up their minds beforehand, for they do not keep the court long waiting. In a few minutes every one has reassembled. "'Gentlemen of the jury, have you considered your verdict?' rings out a harsh, sing-song voice. "'We have,' answers the foreman. "'You find the accused guilty or not guilty of the murder of Lord Westray?' Amidst a silence, terrible in its intensity, comes the answer, Guilty. A thrill of horror runs through the court. There is hardly a dry eye within it. The Duke has got Speranza's hand in his, but she never moves. Hector de Strange, have you any reason to give why sentence of death should not be passed upon you? Again inquires the harsh, sing-song voice. I have, he answers with a low, musical laugh. My reason is that, if I am put to death, murder will indeed be committed, for I am guiltless. I wish to add also one word of explanation, for I see the time has come. Both Sir Anthony and the learned judge have laid great stress on the apparent falsehood of which they allege I have been guilty, in declaring that I am the child of Captain Harry Kintor and Mrs. Delara. They point to the fact that, Dr. Mary Nuth has declared that the child born at Ancona was a girl. Has it never struck you, my lord and gentlemen of the jury, that a girl could do what I have done in youth, a woman accomplish what I have accomplished in mature years? No. I plainly see that this has not struck you, for you are men. You will not acknowledge that a woman can equal man, and with fair opportunities rise to power and fame. Yet such has been my aim in life to prove, for this I have struggled and had it not been for the base machinations of enemies, would assuredly have lived to triumphantly achieve. Know, however, that Hector de Strange is no liar. If for sixteen years he has practiced on society what may be called a fraud, it was for the sake of righting a terrible wrong. My lord and gentlemen of the jury, I again declare myself to be the child of Captain Kintor and Mrs. Delara, but I confess my sex. In Hector de Strange, the world beholds a woman, her name, Gloria de Lara. Amidst confusion and excitement, unparalleled sentence of death is passed. Yet, as the judge's words come to a close, a voice rings through the court, a voice in which defiance and love are mingled. It is a woman's voice. Many recognize it as Flora Desmond's. As there is a God above, it cries, Gloria de Lara shall not die!" But even as all eyes are turned in search of the speaker, Flora Desmond has vanished. End of Book Two, Chapter Four Book Two, Chapter Five of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900, by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or the Revolution of 1900. Book Two, Chapter Five. Guilty! Condemned to death! Hector de Strange, a woman! The words have passed through the court, along the corridors, and out into the street beyond, where the crowds press eagerly forward to hear the news. It is received at first with astonishment and incredulity. Some people call it a hoax, others laugh at the statement as a wild improbability, and wonder what the real truth is. But even as they discuss the rumor, a movement is visible opposite the court, as an officer of the White Guards Regiment makes her appearance outside. 
an orderly mounted on a gray horse is holding an empty saddled white one in readiness, and as the officer makes her appearance, brings the steed alongside the steps leading up to the entrance. The officer is no stranger to the crowd. Flora Desmond's features are well known to it. Is she not the leader of Hector de Strange's special regiment, a regiment entirely drawn from the women of the people? Whatever may be the feeling of the middle class, and a portion of that one which claims to rank above it, in regard to Hector de Strange one thing is certain, that amidst the poor and the needy, amidst the suffering and the struggling, that name is a talisman to conjure by. She comes down the steps hurriedly, and mounts her horse in haste. The crowd sways and presses towards her in spite of the efforts of large numbers of police to repress them. "'The verdict!' they shout inquiringly. "'Tell us the verdict!' She stands up in her stirrups and looks at that sea of faces. Enemies there may be amongst them, hundreds, perhaps, antagonistic to Hector de Strange. But amidst the rough faces of the thousands that press around her, she knows that the majority are true as steel. Guilty, she calls out. He is condemned to die. I mistake the people, however, if they will believe the verdict or acquiesce in the sentence. Say you whom he loves, whose hard lot he has struggled to raise, will you permit it? Never, comes the fierce shout from hundreds, nay, thousands of throats. Hector de Strange shall not die. I knew it, she replies proudly. Justice shall be upheld. I knew the people would be true to him, men as well as women. He shall not die. They cheer and cheer again as she makes her way through the crowd, followed by her orderly. It gives room to her willingly, and opens a passage for her horse. She rides along rapidly in the direction of a quiet side street, well away from the thronging crowd of people. Even as she does so, the rumbling wheels of the prison van strike on her ear. She can see it approaching, surrounded by a strong force of police, and as she does so she urges on her horse. Flora Desmond passes rapidly along the quiet, deserted street until she nearly reaches the end and then turns her horse down a narrow alley leading therefrom. This brings her into a wide spacious yard, around which a big square building is built, in the center of which is a large archway with strong iron gates guarded by two mounted sentries. They salute her as she rides up, and the iron gates are unlocked at once. She rides through them and enters what appears to be an immense riding school, in which are drawn up a hundred troopers of the White Regiment. Her eye scans them keenly and rapidly. They are in perfect order, and look fit for any work. Every face is turned towards her. "'Hector de Strange has been declared guilty,' she says in a clear, distinct voice, "'and is condemned to die. I am here to lead you to his rescue. If any one is to die, it shall be we who will do so, not him. Follow me, guards. There is not a moment to be lost." She places herself at their head. They pass out into the courtyard, and the gates are locked behind them. The sentries fall into their places, and the troopers, six abreast, follow in the wake of their gallant-hearted leader. At a smart trot they pass down the quiet street. In the distance they can hear the roar of the crowd, which is cheering loudly and they know that Hector de Strange is being removed to the prison from which his accusers hope never again to see him issue. They are nearing the crowd now, for it is surging their way. The prison van is coming along at a smart pace, guarded by its bevy of policemen. It is not a hundred yards from where Flora Desmond, at the head of her hundred and two guards, sits motionless on her horse, for she has called a halt and is awaiting their coming. Suddenly, she stands up in her stirrups and turns to her troopers. At the same moment she draws her sword. "'Forward!' she cries, waving it above her head. "'Forward, guards! Of his regiment! Rescue him, or die!' She has put her horse in motion as she speaks, and with the rush of a whirlwind the white guards bear down upon the prison van. The policemen catch sight of them coming and close around it manfully. The driver whips up the horses and urges them along at a canter. Of what avail? The white guards are upon them. Nothing can withstand the charge. It is the work of a moment. Sever the traces. 
Cut the horses loose! shouts Flora Desmond as she gallops up alongside one of the animals and seizing its rein brings it up onto its haunches, one of the troopers doing likewise by the other. They obey her promptly and rapidly, while the remainder engage the police escort who resist gallantly. Of what avail? The crowd has closed round, willing and eager to assist in the work of rescue. The odds are too great to allow the representatives of law and order to prevail. Twice over Flora Desmond has summoned the policeman inside to unlock the door of the van, but he stands to his guns and refuses. "'If you do not,' she cries, "'I shall be forced to fire through the lock until I break it, and the bullets may injure you. Come, man, no use resisting now.' But the policeman is staunch in the performance of what he considers his duty, and remains firm in his determination not to betray his trust. "'Then throw yourself flat on the ground, my man,' again calls out Flora Desmond, "'for I am going to fire.' She pauses for a moment to give him time to obey, then raises a revolver and fires once, twice, thrice through the lock, which gives way at last. The crowd cheers loudly, the door of the van is flung open, and in a moment Flora Desmond is beside Gloria Delara. "'Thank God!' she exclaims. "'Here, come this way. I have a horse all ready for you.' The policeman is lying motionless on the floor of the van. The two step across him and pass quickly out of the wheeled prison. As they do so, the people press forward to welcome their hero, for to them, in spite of the rumors, Gloria Talara is still Hector de Strange. She has mounted her horse and raised her hand to enjoin silence. The police escort has been overcome. Its members are passively accepting what to them is the inevitable. They have sought to do their duty, they can do no more. "'Friends,' she calls out in the voice they know and love so well, "'I have been unjustly accused and unjustly condemned. If it were not so, I would not accept the rescue brought me by my faithful women guards, aided by your kindly and generous devotion. My enemies are those who would fight against true progress, and the abolition of scandals and wrongs which must destroy this great nation with their wickedness unless abolished in time. I have sought to probe to their root these scandals and these wrongs, have sought to submit to you the quickest and surest way to remedy them. I tell you that the greatest evils we have to face are the social ones. To them I ascribe all the sufferings and sins of the poor, the sins and false position of the rich. There are bad laws which must be done away with, good ones which must be set up to accomplish such social reform. Before you can do this, you must set nature on an even footing, and do away with the artificial barriers which you have raised against woman's progress and advancement. For until she has the same powers and opportunities as man, a thorough and exhaustive reform of the evils which afflict society will never be efficiently undertaken. And now, my friends, we are on the eve of a great revolution. If the people will stand by me, I will stand by them. Let us loyally determine to carry this great question to a successful issue, nor rest till it has been accomplished. I am going to trust myself amongst those whom I have ever loved, whose condition I have sought to raise. Yet, ere doing so, I have one confession to make to you. Hector de Strange, whose advancement has been rapid and unparalleled almost in the annals of statesmanship, must be no longer known to you under that name. The time has come when I must confess myself. Before you, you see one of the despised and feeble sex, the unfitted to rule, the inferior of man. I am a woman. Henceforth, I am no longer Hector de Strange, but Gloria de Lara. She has ceased speaking and begun to move her horse through the crowd. Men and women press round her to kiss her hand. Poor men are more generous than rich ones. With rare exceptions, the fire of suffering purifies from self and makes the heart appreciate true worth more readily. It is the people's voice that generally forces on all great reforms. It is the people's will that carries everything before it, when the reform required is a just one. It never enters these men's minds to depreciate her deeds, to belittle her acts because she is a woman. Their reason tells them that she understands their wants, 
that her great heart is in sympathy with their needs, that she has sought to help them when in power, and that now her enemies have got the upper hand, all their loyalty and devotion is needed to support the cause, which she has told them lies at the root of all future social reform, which means progress, comfort and happiness for the toiling millions. But there is a sound of many horses' feet coming towards them, and all eyes are turned in the direction whence the sounds come. The ever-increasing crowd sways to and fro, expectant and anxious, instinctively apprehending what is to come. "'Form up, guards!' Flora Desmond's voice is heard shouting. "'Close round her, and defend her with your lives. It is not we who seek to spill blood, but if our rulers will have it so, then let it be. We will show them that woman is not the helpless coward they imagine. If necessary, we will fight to save her. Retreat in good order on Montegree House." They close round her, obedient to the order. The movement is executed silently but swiftly, and with an exactitude which speaks volumes for the discipline of the White Guards. Shade of White Melville, could ye arise now, you would behold your prophecy an accomplished fact, for the Amazons, whom you predicted, if rendered amenable to discipline, would conquer the world, are before you there." The sounds have assumed shape, and a troop of horse-guards blue, hastily turned out to support the arm of the law, are in view now. The horses have been ridden at a good pace, for the foam studs their black shining coats. At the word of command the troopers rein up. The position is a difficult one. Between them and the white guards a dense, impenetrable crowd is surging. To charge that crowd means death to many, yet it can only be compassed in this manner. The order which the officer in command has received is, however, specific. As to disperse the crowd, to give every assistance to the police, and to recapture the prisoner at any cost. It is a soldier's duty to obey superior orders, nor question the why or wherefore. It is no part of a soldier's duty to use his own discretion. His not to reason why, his but to do and die. So at least thinks Colonel Jack Delamere, as his quick eye takes in the scene. Duty is a strange thing. It nerves the heart not only to physical but to moral deeds of courage. Surely it is no insignificant act of the latter which draws from that gallant officer the command to obey an order which he loathes, for apart from all other considerations Jack Delamere loves Flora Desmond, and knowing her as he does he is aware that the order will probably mean death to the being for whom he would willingly sacrifice his own life. Make way, my friends," he calls out imploringly to the people. Make way, I beseech of you. My orders are to disperse the crowd, and I must obey them. If you do not make way, I shall be forced to order my men to charge." A loud shout of defiance is the only reply which he receives. There are heroes and heroines in that crowd. They are resolved that only over their trampled and crushed bodies shall Jack Delamere and his blues come up with the White Guards, who are retreating in good order with Gloria Delara in their midst. Every minute is precious for this latter, and the crowd will do its best to afford these precious minutes. There is a tremor in Jack Delamere's voice as he once more puts his request. The crowd mistakes it for a sign of anger, and defy him with jeers and sneers. Then it be so, he says sadly, as with a heavy heart he gives the order which must bring death to many. His men obey. The black horses charge into the swaying mass, and men and women go down before them. Some make a desperate fight for it before they succumb, clinging to the animals' bridles and attempting to force them back from their onward career. But the troopers have their swords out, and the unarmed cannot prevail over the armed. Nevertheless, there is no surrender, no cry for quarter or mercy. The crowd are in earnest in their desire to let the white guards get away with their beloved charge, and their resistance is dogged and determined. The police have joined in, and are using their batons freely. Shouts and cries resound, and the crowd grows denser every moment, swelled by the numbers that have hastened to the scene. Dead and dying are lying on the cold stone pavements of the street. Even the latter are forgotten in the fierce fight that is raging, 
a fight undertaken by the people that the idol of their hearts may live. It is an unequal contest, and can only end one way. Nigh every trooper has cut his way through at the expense of many a life. They are reforming now, and with Jack Delamere at their head, set off in pursuit of the white guards, the crowd following as best it can in the rear. But its devotion and sturdy resistance have given the start to Gloria Delara's escort, and ride as they may, the blues on their black horses cannot come up with the lightly mounted greys of the white guards. These flash along Whitehall at full speed with their precious charge in their midst. Another moment, and the hoofs of the horses are clattering through the entrance to Montregree House. It is the work of an instant for the great folding doors to unclose. Once through them, and Gloria Delare is safe. Flora Desmond has laid her hand on the bridle of this latter's horse. "'Quick!' she exclaims. "'Pass in there, Gloria. Ah, do not delay. Remember that your life means liberty to thousands. It is not a question of self. I know well how you would wish to stay and help us, but your duty is to preserve your life first. No one doubts your courage." "'God bless you, Flora. Yes, I will do my duty, for the sake of the great cause that shall triumph.' She springs from her horse as she speaks, and as one of the troopers leads it towards the stables she turns to the others. "'Brave guards!' she exclaims. None know better than you that Gloria de Lara is grateful for your devotion and staunch loyalty. "'We would die for you!' they shout enthusiastically, and many of their voices tremble. Even as they cease, the Duke of Ravensdale is on the threshold of his noble mansion. His hand is on Gloria's arm. "'Great God be praised!' bursts from his white lips. "'Gloria, they shall never touch you here!' He draws her gently into the great front hall, and the door is closed and barred behind them. There is a triumphant smile on Flora Desmond's features. Her quick ear has caught the sound of galloping horses. "'Do you hear them?' she laughs defiantly. "'They come too late. Brave people! They have done their part well, and she is saved. Now follow me, guards. She has no need of us just yet. We must seek a safety for the future good that we may do and for the sake of the cause we love. There is work ahead of us, hard work, and plenty too, for the revolution has begun. End of Book Two, Chapter Five Book Two, Chapter Six of Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900 By Lady Florence Dixie This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana, or The Revolution of 1900. Book Two, Chapter Six. My dear, how did you ever manage to get here? How could you venture out? Isn't it terrible, my dear? exclaims Mrs. de Lacey Trevor as her friend Lady Manderton enters her boudoir in the snug Piccadilly mansion already introduced to the reader on the morning following upon the events related in the last chapter. Outside the streets are filled with an angry and excited crowd. The rougher element have taken advantage of the melee to introduce themselves into its midst, and are parading the streets, causing confusion and terror to the more respectable and orderly portion of the crowd, whose presence is to be accounted for by totally different circumstances to those which have attracted the irredeemable portion of society. The news of the verdict and sentence on Hector de Strange, the confession as to sex of the late Prime Minister, the daring and masterly rescue of the prisoner by Flora Desmond and her white guards, the devoted resistance of the crowd to the charge of the blues under Colonel Delamere, and the ultimate escape of Gloria de Lara from her pursuers, has spread like wildfire through the metropolis. London has been in a state of the greatest excitement throughout the night. The most startling and improbable rumors have been afloat as to the intentions of the government, while the people are loudly clamoring for a squashing of the verdict an annulment of the sentence, and a free pardon for their idol, to many more than ever popular now that her sex is disclosed. For let it be whispered that this disclosure has operated in winning over to Gloria de Lara's side many a wavering mind, which is able now to recognize in the brilliant successful life of Hector de Strange the unanswerable and irrefutable proof of woman's power to equal man in all things, and provided fair play and equal opportunities be given to her. 
of the murder of Lord Westray, her adherents believe her to be absolutely guiltless, and are loud in condemnation of the verdict. Such is the position of affairs on the morning in question, a position sufficiently grave to warrant the calling out of the troops to assist the police in maintaining order, amidst this wholly unparalleled scene of public protest and sympathy. There is a quiet smile on Lady Manderton's face as she answers her friend. "'I came here on foot, Vivi, and I have come to say good-bye. Ah, Vivi, you need not stare, dear. I'm not the old dodo you have been accustomed to. Great God, why were not my eyes open before, all the time that Hector de Strange has been working for us? But it is not too late. I can retrieve the past even yet, by working on behalf of Gloria Dolores' cause. Ay, Vivi, it is a cause well worth dying for. Why, Dodo, you must be clean gone cracked. What are you going to do? Lady Manderton takes a newspaper out of her pocket and hands it to Mrs. de Lacy Trevor. Have you read this? she inquires at the same time. Mrs. de Lacy Trevor opens it and reads. The Great de Strange Trial. Speeches of the Attorney General and Hector de Strange. The judges summing up. Verdict and sentence. Extraordinary confession of the prisoner. Sentence of death. Daring rescue of the prisoner by Lady Flora Desmond and White Guards. Determined resistance to the military. Great loss of life. Death of the policeman Fortescue, who is in charge of the prisoner. Warrants out for the arrest of Gloria Delara and Lady Flora Desmond. Beneath these startling announcements, Mrs. de Lacy Trevor further reads much of which she did not know. Then she lays down the paper. "'My dear, it's like a dream!' she exclaims. "'What will happen?' "'What has happened already?' answers Lady Manderton. "'Revolution. Vivi,' she continues eagerly, "'I suppose it's no use asking you to take the step I'm taking, too. I'm going to throw my lot with Gloria Delara and help her by every means in my poor power.' "'Dodo, what do you mean?' cries her friend in a horrified voice. I mean what I have said, Vivi," answers Lady Manderton in a quiet, sad voice. Vivi, I can't tell you how terribly I feel my past wasted life. But it was not all my fault. I was brought up to nothing better, and probably should never have realized it, if Hector de Strange had not been born. Ah, Vivi, glorious life has opened my eyes. I see now that if woman had fair play, women in the position of you and I, Vivi, would never throw away and waste our lives as we have done. But thank God there is a chance of remedying it. At any rate, I'll do my best. For Gloria Delora's noble cause I would die willingly a thousand times." She has taken her friend's hand as she speaks. "'Good-bye, Vivi,' she says gently. But Vivi has risen and thrown her arms round Lady Manderton's neck. "'Don't, don't, Dodo! You mustn't go! There are going to be terrible doings. I can see that plainly. Oh, Dodo, please don't go." There is just a slight curl of contempt upon the lips of Lady Manderton's handsome mouth as she kisses the weak, timid woman, whom all these years she has been contented to call friend. Then she gently undoes the tightly clasped hands of Lady Trevor from around her neck, and presses her firmly but kindly back into her seat. I have no fear, Vivi. There now, don't cry. You will hear of me soon, dear. God grant better employed than I have been. There now, think of what I've said. Good-bye." The next moment she is gone, and Vivi Trevor is left alone. For a time she sits like one in a dream, then she rises and walks to the window. The crowd is still surging to and fro. All traffic is rendered impossible save on foot. Mounted policemen and military patrol the street interfering as little as possible with the people, who say for the rougher elements already mentioned are orderly enough, albeit excited and angry. "'What will happen?' mutters Vivi to herself. "'What a strange sight! Never realized before what a number of people London contains, and what a strange-looking lot, too! Didn't think there were such people in existence!' There is a knock at her boudoir door as she stands thus soliloquizing to herself. "'Come in,' she answers. It is Marie, the French maid, and she is the bearer of a note. "'A letter for the madame,' she says. 
"'Marie, what a fearful crowd!' exclaims her mistress. "'What will happen? Have you ever seen anything like it before?' "'Mais jamais, jamais de la mie vie, madame,' answers the Frenchwoman, shuddering. "'C'est terrible!' "'Marie, you can bring me my coffee and bread and butter now,' continues Vivi, as she turns the note over in her hand and looks at it curiously. It is from Mr. Trevor. "'Madame will have to take café noir this morning,' remarks the maid gloomily. "'Café noir? You know I hate it, Marie.' "'Taint pis, madame,' replies the woman, with a shrug of the shoulders. "'But no milkman has called, and there is no milk in the house.' "'But we shall starve, Marie!' exclaims her mistress. "'Je le crois bien, madame,' is all the other replies, as she leaves the room. Marie is not a stranger to revolution. She was in Paris as a young girl during the revolt which cost Napoleon III his throne. She knows well the suffering which an upheaval of the people always brings with it. She will be astonished at nothing that may come. Has she not been detailing her experiences downstairs to the frightened servants, who are undergoing their first hardships in Mr. and Mrs. de Lacy Trevor's luxurious service by having to go without milk in their tea that morning? Do they, by any chance, cast a thought to the suffering thousands who have no tea into which to put either milk or sugar, those suffering thousands whose conditions and very existence has given the brain of Gloria Delara many a racking thought, as, when in power, she has pondered the problem, so far unraveled, of their amelioration and upraising. Not a bit of it. These servants do not realize a suffering which they have never seen. It is just the world's way. No one half of it knows how the other half lives. Left alone, Vivi Trevor opens her husband's note. She thinks it strange he should write to her. He has never to her before while staying under the same roof. She has not set eyes on him since the day before, when he parted with her after the trial, conviction, and sentence of Hector de Strange. He had not come in to dinner that night, nothing out of the way to Vivi, the comings and goings of her husband being of small importance or interest to her. These two have drifted more than ever apart since the days when Mr. Trevor first had his eyes opened by the Eaton Boys article in the Free Review. He has never sought to interfere with his wife's going on, feeling that to do so would only make his desolate home more unhomely and comfortless than ever. It is therefore with some surprise that Vivi reads the following. My dearest Vivi, you will wonder at these few lines but I feel I owe you some little explanation, though whether you will care about it I know not. Our lives as regards one another have not been over-happy. At least I can speak for myself in saying so. I do not blame you, Vivi, for the want of affection you have always shown me, or for your goings-on with other men. The fault lies in your bringing up, and the false position in which your sex is placed by man's unnatural laws. I learned to recognize this long ago, and to acknowledge the teaching of Hector de Strange as true and just. That noble genius, now unveiled to a wandering world as Gloria de Lara, is paying the penalty of her attempt to naturalize woman's position in this world, as a lead-up to many and much-needed social reforms. I feel strongly that in this moment of trial she should receive the support of all men and women, high and low, rich and poor, who feel with her, and I have determined to place my services at her disposal. This, Vivi, will naturally take me away from you for a time, perhaps forever. Who knows? Only God. You will not miss me, for I have never been anything to you. I do not blame you, dearest, for I ought never to have married you. Still, I loved you, and love you still. That is my only plea, and I ask your forgiveness. You will perhaps accord it when you realize that I am giving my life to the uprising of your sex, and to attaining its freedom, thereby accomplishing the first great step in the direction of social reform, on which the gaze of Gloria de Lara is fixed. How this struggle will end, I know not. It will be the greatest revolution this world has ever known, far-reaching in its results, and, let us hope and pray, bringing about a final, fair, and lasting settlement of that all-momentous question which has given to the world its noblest woman and Gloria de Lara. Good-bye, Vivi. 
Your ever devoted husband, Launcelot Trevor. She lays the letter down on her lap and sits staring at it. Her thoughts fly back across the years of her wedded life, years spent in vain amusements and false excitements. She cannot recall a single kindly or unselfish act on her part towards the man who has loved her so devotedly and tenderly, nor can she lay hold of one single act of usefulness upon which she can look back with either pleasure or satisfaction. Very acutely she feels this now, and yet has it been entirely her own fault? What else could I do? she murmurs to herself. I was never brought up to think of anything else. Mother bade me marry well and quickly. That's exactly what I did do. What other opening was given me? None. If I had been a man, and properly educated, I might have done something. But, as it was, what else could I do?" Her thoughts are flying on ahead now, to that vague future of which she can know nothing till it comes. Yet what hope does that glance ahead bring to Vivi Trevor? Absolutely none. In the past her life has been wasted, and now the future, when regarded, brings her nothing but the vague dread of growing old and passé, with nothing to turn to when that time comes, nothing to console her for the gay, giddy life which she has led in the past. She is beginning to understand Lady Manderton's words and action better now. Launcelot Trevor's note has opened her eyes very wide. Vivi vividly sees what she has never seen before, for she is beginning to think for the first time. She throws herself face downwards on the sofa upon which she has been reclining so daintily, when Lady Manderton called in upon her but a short time since. There is a big black void all round Vivi Trevor's heart, a dull, hopeless feeling of despair. Large tears are welling up into her beautiful eyes, and bitter sobs shake her slight, girlish frame. Poor Vivi! She is truly miserable, and yet she has no idea how to end that misery. In a like position Lady Manderton has risen equal to the occasion, but then the latter is of different stuff to her hitherto gay, unthinking friend, a woman of stronger brain and sterner mould one who is able to make up her mind and act promptly when occasion requires it. There she lies, this victim of neglected childhood and unfair, unnatural laws. She lies there, a living protest against the selfishness and conceit that have built up that wall within which she lies imprisoned. Of what good is life to such as she, whose education since childhood has been vain, mindless, ephemeral? If Vivi Trevor had never been born, the world would have lost nothing. And yet, as a drop is to an ocean, so is the life of this one despairing soul to the thousands who, like her, have gone down to their graves in uselessness and obscurity, not because in natural body and mind they were unfitted to work in the great army of man, not because in desire and willingness they were found wanting, but because of that barrier that artificial mountain which one sex has forbidden the other sex to climb, which one sex has erected in the face of nature, to shut out the operations of nature's laws. These words but reflect the thoughts of thousands, who, wearily struggling along the path of life, ask themselves wonderingly, why existence if this is all it brings? Many a tired and saddened soul has lain itself down to die, with the undefined feeling that the wasted life left behind might not have been if only, only, I if only what? Gloria Delara, Flora Desmond and others could answer that vague yearning cry. They would reply, if only nature had been obeyed. Therein lies the secret of the troubles of this world, the suffering, agony and misery that millions have to put up with while a clique lives and reigns, making laws and leading the multitude by the nose under the guise of liberty and freedom. For every happy heart thousands there are of wretched ones, for every well-fed mortal thousands there are who starve and suffer. The world is old, its years unknown to the ken of man. Through all these years man has ruled therein, and this is what he has brought it to. Can he do no better? Yes, but only hand in hand with woman. Nature declares it, and he who would fight against nature must create the evils that torture the world. 
End of Book Two, Chapter Six. Book Two, Chapter Seven of Gloriana or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred by Lady Florence Dixie. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Gloriana or the Revolution of Nineteen Hundred. Book Two, Chapter Seven. Downing Street is awake betimes, and within the precincts of the residence of the First Lord of the Treasury, an unusual stir and signs of an unwanted anxiety are perceivable. Seated around a long oblong table, in a singularly doleful-looking room, are a baker's dozen of gentlemen, apparently in eager discussion. Perplexity and anxiety is on every face, not unmixed in some cases with vacuity. A stranger, dropped from the clouds, and unaccustomed to the ways and manners and customs of our planet, might innocently inquire who these disturbed-looking personages are, and what their business. He would be told in reply that the personages are nothing more nor less than the sovereign of Great Britain's ministers, their business the holding of a cabinet council. But at such an hour, nine o'clock in the morning! Why, in the ordinary course of affairs, poor old Lord Muddlehead, the Secretary of State for the Colonies, would be adjusting his nightcap and turning over for his second sleep in bed, and that excellent non-entity, Lord Do-Nothing, Lord President of the Council and Privy Seal, would be sweetly dreaming of rest and peace, well merited and well earned, after the arduous and fatiguing duties attaching to his noble office. However, a matter of importance has shaken sleep from their eyes, as they have been summoned post-haste to attend their chief on urgent public business. The chief in question, the first Lord of the Treasury, the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Ireland, is the Duke of Devonsmere a tall, aristocratic-looking man, with thick moustaches, whiskers and beard, in which the grey hairs of advancing age are rapidly gathering. He has thick lips, a not very pleasant eye, and a forehead chiefly remarkable for the crease or wrinkle, which, starting from the centre, runs down perpendicularly to meet the nose. He has a voice far from genial, and, in fact, his manner all round is cold and haughty and unwinning. The Duke is a good speaker. That is his chief forte. He has not particularly distinguished himself through life as a great politician, though he has held high posts in various ministries. He has been secretary for war in a former ministry, but seceded from his chief when this latter brought in his Irish Home Rule Bill. No one has ever been able to accuse the Duke of Devonsmere of attempting to aggrandize himself. In politics, he has been strictly honest according to his lights, though many believe that in the old days of conservatives and liberals he would have graced more appropriately the ranks of the former, which, as a unionist, he eventually joined. However, those days are past. There are no liberals or conservatives or unionists now, the former having adopted the progressist title, the two latter becoming merged in the National Party, of which party the Duke of Devonsmere is the head. The position which he holds at this moment is an awkward one. His is only a provisional ministry, held together by the temporary support of the Progressist Party, the natural and avowed enemy of the Nationals. But the hatred of the Progressist for the Destrangeites is so intense that for a time their minor enmity with the Nationals is merged and forgotten in this new and greater one. It is, therefore, with such assistance as this, that the Duke, with a cabinet chiefly distinguished for its dullness and want of perspicacity, is endeavouring to cope with the extraordinary state of affairs that has arisen on the defeat of Hector de Strange's policy, and the revolution which has resulted from the events following upon that defeat. Gloria de Lara is at large. Although warrants have been issued for her arrest as well as that of Lady Flora Desmond, no traces of either have yet been discovered. Of course, the officials of Scotland Yard surrounded Montagree House, and demanded admission soon after the former's rescue. But when at length the great front door was thrown open for the admittance of the officers of the law, they were received only by Lord Bernard Fontenoy, who smilingly regretted that he could afford them no information or assist their search in any way. All he knew was that his brother had left him in charge of Montagree House during his unavoidable absence. 
clearly there was very little to be extracted from the youthful lord. The Home Department Minister is speaking now, but apparently affording but cold comfort to his colleagues. Mr. Mayhew belongs to the English Bar. He is an excellent speaker, but that is all. It would have been better if he had stuck to his profession exclusively, and left politics alone, for he has not shown in them. He is a weak man, and an obstinate one, and can never be got to acknowledge having committed a mistake. He has held office before in a conservative ministry in the same department, which did not profit much by his supervision, or attain any particular distinction for efficiency. He is the best man, however, that the Nationals have at their command for the post, which is not saying much for the existing state of things. Detectives are at work in nearly every great centre, and the police are fully instructed how to act," he assures his colleagues. "'Don't you think, Mayhew, that Hector de Strange, or, as I suppose we must call her now, Gloria de Lara, has many secret friends in the force? There is no doubt she has the mass of working classes of the country on her side, certainly nearly every woman against them. Depend upon it, your detectives will not trace her and it seems to me you are all of you vastly underrating her power." The speaker is a man of about fifty years of age, with a fine forehead, rather scant hair, prominent intelligent eyes, a sallow complexion, and somewhat of the middle height. He looks younger than he really is, and it is probably his long thick moustache that gives him a little of the military appearance. But Lord Pandolf Chertsey is no soldier. He is every inch a politician living for nothing else but politics. While we can pass over the remainder of the Devonsmere cabinet without notice, because of the extreme mediocrity of talent displayed therein, a glance at the character of Lord Pandolf Chertsey is necessary. The extraordinary point which first strikes one is, why is not Lord Pandolf Prime Minister? Clearly, amongst all those thirteen gentlemen, he is the only one possessing a large grasp of thought or a power to look at events and regard them as they are. Few men have been more abused than Lord Pandolf. And yet he has done nothing to merit that abuse beyond showing a certain independence of mind and an inclination to follow the dictates of conscience before party. He has been accused of ambition. It is certain that if he had been less honest in his political career and less straightforward, he might have risen more quickly to supreme power. But though doubtless ambitious, and what sin is there in that, he has known how to subordinate his ambition to the dictates of his conscience in all matters, which, according to his lights, he believes affects the welfare of society. He sees clearly now what the high and dignified Duke of Devonsmere, old Lord Muddlehead, Lord Do-Nothing, and their colleagues do not see in the least. He sees that Gloria de Lara, though she may have many an enemy in the country, is yet a power which must not be despised. Lord Pandolf has no sympathy with her cause or her teachings, but that is no reason why he should ignore the fact that there are thousands who have, and who are prepared to support her. Mr. Mayhew shakes his head. We have said he is an obstinate man, and obstinacy is more or less a sign of weakness. "'No, no,' he says hastily, "'I think it is you, Chertsey, who overrate her power. Of course she has a few friends, but not many. I always said de Strangeism is ephemeral. You will see how quickly the storm she has raised will become subdued. I have not the slightest doubt on that score. But for the sake of law and order we must strain every nerve to arrest both her and Lady Flora. It is a terrible business, but murder cannot go unpunished, that is very clear." Lord Pandolf laughs as he glances at the Duke, who is sprawling back in his chair with his legs stretched out. Mr. Mayhew's remarks appear to him ridiculous. "'Depend upon it,' he exclaims again, "'that you are utterly underrating her power. We know enough of Hector de Strange to be pretty well certain that Gloria de Lara will not remain inactive. You talk of your detectives and police, but let me remind you that there are scattered throughout the country those companies of women volunteers whom she shall call out at any moment. Surely you do not underrate their power for mischief." But Mr. Mayhew does, and so do the rest of the cabinet, including the Duke of Devonsmere. 
This latter is a bitter opponent of Gloria Delara's advocacy for woman's freedom. He is quite convinced that the sex is hopelessly inferior to his own, and regards their emancipation with the same horror as did the South in the American Civil War, when the North upheld the abolition of slavery. "'I think we are straying wide of the mark, Chertsey," he observes rather gruffly. "'The policy we have got to decide on is how the riotous crowds that are paralyzing public freedom are to be suppressed. There is no doubt that for the moment this adventuress has a strong party in her favor, but I think, with Mayhew, that all sympathy with her will quickly subside, especially if the government show a bold and determined front to the mutineers. The most strenuous efforts must be made to arrest those two women, and so put an end to the mutiny which they have provoked. I consider, therefore, that the military ought to be employed to assist the police, and I have little doubt that in very short time order will be restored. Do you all think with me?" The eleven satellites do, but not the independent planet. Lord Pandolf does not agree, and says so plainly. He thinks it will be madness to employ the military, and thus provoke civil brawls, and perhaps civil war. He cannot make himself responsible for such a state of things. "'I am very sorry,' he says gravely, "'but I am quite unable to fall in with such a policy, which, if pursued, I believe would entail lamentable results. Do your best, if you think it possible, to arrest the leaders of this movement by means of detectives and police, but for goodness' sake keep the soldiers out of the fray. However, if you persist, I can make way for a fresh secretary for India. I can resign." "'That is an old game with you,' remarks the Duke dryly. "'It will not be the first time you have left your colleagues in the lurch. Say rather, not the first time that I have refused to stifle conscience for the sake of office, or to make over my honest opinion to the care of others,' answers Lord Pandolf somewhat hotly, nettled no doubt by the Duke's unfair remark. However he continues quietly, I have no wish to mar the unanimity of these proceedings, and will withdraw. My reasons for resignation can be fully explained in the proper place." There is a significant ring in his voice which cannot be mistaken. The Duke knows perfectly well that with Lord Pandolf out of his cabinet this excellent clique will be little less than a group of mechanical dolls. To lose Lord Pandolf means discredit to his ministry and a considerable loss of confidence outside it. He feels he must temporize. "'Really, Chertsey, I don't understand what you want,' he observes impatiently. "'A short while ago you were making fun of the detective force, and assuring us we had underrated Gloria Dolores' power. Now that I propose to take decisive measure to arrest that power, you object to them. Will you propose a policy yourself?' "'Well, I will, as you invite me to do so,' answers Lord Pandolf with a smile. "'But I do not suppose you will adopt it. However, here is my opinion. I am not in sympathy with Gloria Delara's desires, but I fully recognize that her doctrines are accepted by thousands. I am not likely to forget that it was she who raised the Hall of Liberty, who drilled into efficiency a large woman volunteer force and who has worked her way into the affections of vast numbers of the working classes. Having read the evidence at her trial, I am extremely dissatisfied with the verdict, while in regard to the death of the policeman in the prison van, I do not look upon Lady Flora's act as murder. We are assured by members of the police force that she fired through the lock of the van, only after giving the policeman full warning of her intention to do so. She naturally supposed he had lain down as she bade him and though his death is most grievous, really, she cannot be accused of murder. Looking at matters in this light, I think the wisest thing the present government can do is to appeal to the country to decide the question, revoke the warrant against Lady Flora, and offer Gloria Delara a fresh trial. Such a policy may be out of the way, but we must not forget that we are now facing a state of affairs unparalleled in the world's history. For my part, I cannot take the responsibility of deciding for the country. It is the country which should be appealed to, and allowed to decide for itself." He is spoken as befits a statesman, 
who is able and willing to look upon the people as the proper tribunal to decide the policy to be pursued. But the Duke of Devonsmere, unlike Lord Pandolf, has never and will never be able to quit his aristocratic perch in order to descend to the people's level. He is willing to give them a policy and ask them to accept it, but he cannot realize that the masses are able to produce one for themselves. It is not wonderful that he thinks as he does, for he is not, and never has been, in touch with the people. Like Mr. Mayhew, he shakes his head. Your proposal is simple madness, Chertsey. I, for one, cannot fall in with it. He looks sternly at the eleven satellites who are regarding him. They thoroughly understand that look. No, we, they murmur deferentially, aping the abject acquiescence of poor old Lord Muddlehead. Again Lord Pandolf laughs. Words would not measure the contemptuous ring that there is in that laugh. And you will pardon me if I say that I think your proposal madness also. I cannot agree to it, and it is best I should resign, he says quietly. Very well answers the Duke coldly. As you are determined, so be it, Chertsey." Lord Pandolf rises. He accepts his congé willingly. It has been gall and wormwood to work with such colleagues as these. He is out of place, and he feels it. He knows that he ought to be where the Duke is sitting. Undoubtedly, he ought. Then, it is understood, I shall tender my resignation without any delay so that you will be able to nominate my successor. This being so, it is better I should retire at once. Good morning, Devonsmere." And without deigning recognition of the eleven satellites, Lord Pandolf leaves the room. "'Really, Chertsey is about the most insufferable fellow to deal with I have ever known,' murmurs Lord Hankney, the Minister for Agriculture, adjusting his eyeglass. "'We shall do much better without him, Devonsmere. So they sit on in council, these strange twelve, a ministry misrepresentative of the people. The policy against which Lord Pandolf warned them, they agree to adopt. The military is to be ordered out, a direct incentive to civil war, while the warrants for the arrest of Gloria Delara and Lady Flora Desmond are to remain in force. It is the old story, merely history repeating itself, of a group of men omitting to consult the people, whose paid servants they are, before acting office, unfortunately nowadays, is too much considered as the happy hunting-ground of a clique or class, to the exclusion of the people's acknowledged representatives. So the wrong men step in and take upon themselves responsibilities for which they are totally disqualified and unfitted, and thus are mistakes committed for which those who pay the taxes have to suffer. The case in point is a good one. Such a decision would never have been come to had the Duke of Devonsmere's cabinet contained some of the people's representatives. End of Book Two, Chapter Seven.